This talk is titled, A Unified Proposal for Analyzing Intervals Between Events in Space-Time, given by me, Doug Sweetser, in spring of 2017 at an APS meeting at WPI. We have three people, a referee, a girl who's moving at a steady skippy space uh, rate, and a balloon girl who's floating high in the sky, and they're just looking at these two explosions. They are doing so with uh, rulers and clocks that measure things to 20 significant digits. Well, at least in theory, because of course they mean much more complicated devices, but we're doing this in theory. So they measure these two events. They have their own origins in space. They have their own origins in time. They have their own angles on things. So none of their measurements are going to be exactly the same. Uh, and so that's why we give primes for the skipping girl and double primes for balloon girl. And what we want to do is have the ref understand what's going on with those other two people who are measuring with exactly the same equipment. The way we do this today is to use the math of differential geometry to calculate differential intervals. So a point on a manifold is kind of dull. Instead, what we do is we create a tangent space that is that, that creates this tangent vector that we can then use a metric tensor to contract, and we get this uh, dt squared minus dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared. Now, metrics are actually very general tools. Here are all 16 terms, and... Of course, they're very, as I say, very general. You can use, for example, spherical coordinates. If you do that, then the G will depend on a, like uh, radial distance and where you are in space-time affects uh, the G that you get to use. I have actually chosen to write this all out in Cartesian coordinates for very specific reasons we'll get to soon. So the ref goes and explains the moving girl by using special relativity and that uses group theory, specifically the Poincaré group, on that four vector and says, wow, you can have different values, but when you calculate this square, this differential interval, you'll end up with exactly the same value. Now, if the ref wants to go and explain balloon girl, that requires general relativity because that only changes the metric, leaves the values completely alone. And general relativity is a field theory with 10 nonlinear differential equations next to impossible to ever solve, so everyone uses the same one. I think there's actually two deep problems with uh, dynamic metric uh, theories, such as general relativity. And one of them is that for something like EM that has this anti-symmetric field strength tensor, it can't provide you any information about that symmetric metric changing. And therefore, you must supply a metric as part of the background mathematical structure. And in newsgroup days, uh, Professor John Baez used to always uh, emphasize that that was a really important shortcoming. Just assume it's flat and you can do great work. That's true for the weak force. That's true for the strong force. Now, I have noticed another problem with it that you start with four bits of information, dt, dx, dy, dz, about the, the events, and then you get only one piece of information in return. So to me, that sounds like you are destroying information content. You know, the overall information content is less. And I don't think that's the way physics works. Now, this is usually talked about in the context of quantum field theory or black holes, and this is a classical situation, but who cares? I think the logic of physics is consistent, and so you better care about this kind of issue. And I don't think any of the work with extra dimensions and strings will resolve either of these two problems. And, you know, Wilson loops, are they going to uh, deal with this second problem? I don't think so. So I think it's time to crack some eggs. Come on, let's, let's destroy everything just to rebuild it. That's the tradition that happens in physics. So what I propose to do is to rigidly fix all 16 pairs of products by the rules of a rank zero object, specifically uh, the product rule of quaternions. 
Now, you may not have heard of quaternions, you may have only heard of vector calculus, but vector calculus is basically all the guts of quaternions uh, put together in a particular way. So you see all these ones, well, that's really easy, and there are some minus ones down the diagonal, and that makes, you know, the, the kind of flat metric you expect to see. And then the minus ones that are off, the, that's just basically the cross product. And instead of just getting the interval, I actually take these 16 things and I put them in four sets of four. And unit quaternions are actually at the center of the standard model because the gauge symmetry SU2 of the weak force is known as a unit quaternions. So it's important to, to think they are important because they're in the center of the standard model. Quaternions completely fix the, those two problems, uh, that the rules now are fixed. So <laughs> they've been doing it that way for years, so I'm giving a thumbs up. And squaring four numbers yields four numbers. That's great. But it also creates at least two problems. One is that people are used to using different coordinate systems, and they still want to do so. And you have to deal with gravity. And gravity is about the metric changing depending on where you go, not that all the g factors of g are going to be the same, either 1 or minus 1. You can use any variable system you'd like. Just convert it to the Cartesian numerical representation when you want to multiply things together. So, for example, in spherical coordinates you have um, r and a couple of angles. And so we know this rule for calculating x, y, and z, and just use it. And so this is really a power grab because post-1915, where differential geometry just took over, I'm proposing that number theory maybe pull back the power and st stick in this Cartesian thing. And, you know, yes, go ahead, use whatever numerical system you want. Uh, I mean, coordinate system you want. Just know how to get to Cartesian and then use that. So you can choose whatever you like. But gravity? Hmm. Here's the money quote. Had I to compose a one-sentence scientific biography of him, I would write, better than anyone before or after him, he knew how to invent invariance principles and make use of statistical fluctuations. Now, in the fall of 2015, that highlighted clause actually got me thinking about something I thought about for years, and that is to look at the square of a quaternion again, thinking about a new invariance principle made possible by the new terms. Okay, so the first term, hey, that leads right to special relativity. But what could the other three be? Could they be gravity? Well, first of all, what's their name? We know what space over time is. That's velocity, and that appears absolutely everywhere. But what is space times time? I mean, I literally didn't have a name for it. So I came up with my own, space times time. I bet you can guess where I got it. Okay, but is that a thing? Well, let's think about space and space. We know space over space is an angle. And we know that space times space is an area. And we know from special relativity that we should think about time and space as being very, very closely related. What we can do with time, we can do with space. Well, if we can have a space-time space, we should have a space times time. But you say, hold on a second, it wasn't used by the ancients, it wasn't used by Newton, it wasn't used by Einstein, it wasn't used by anybody around, why should I care? <laughs> well, let's take out uh, Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, and notice if space times time is actually a conserved thing in gravity. And you see that in the Schwarzschild coordinates, the Schwarzschild solution just happens to be a perfect kind of cancellation if I were to write it in Cartesian. 
And well, that was kind of lucky, but it was also a coordinate dependent statement. And if I choose different coordinates, it's going to probably just be approximate. And so the battle line here is that I want the invariance principle to be exact and say that general relativity got an approximate symmetry that was really pretty excellent. But exact things usually went out over approximate situations. One way to see this, I think, relatively quickly is the graph theory, or sorry, it's the analytic geometry. This is the, the light cone of special relativity in yellow and purple. And we've got dt squared minus dr squared. And those hyperboles, the positive ones are in the yellow. And those are constant, you know, dt squared minus dr squared. The negative values are in the purple side. And when it's zero, that's the, the, the light cone itself. And even my daughter noticed, well, the green one is just the purple one rotated by 45 degrees. <laughs> and uh, I'm saying gravity is this constant space times time. And dt equaling zero, oh yeah, that'll be zero. And dr being zero, yeah, that'll be zero. And if you take the derivatives of these with respect to dt and dr, you'll see, yeah, they really are kind of ha have the same, same kind of curvy stuff, uh, just uh, rotated by a little bit. The big problem, though, is that, you know, since Newton's time, we say we expect to solve a differential equation and then use algebra to eliminate constants and match the data. In special relativity, there are no field equations. It's just all an algebra problem trying to match the data. Make sure that all our inertial observers see that the speed of light is, is the same. Well, quaternion gravity has no field equations. Uh, <laughs> it's again an algebra problem, and it's got to be consistent with the data. So what data are we going to uh, be concern ourselves with? Well, let's think about what happens in gravity. It's a function of mass over r, that, that ratio, true since Newton's time. And in fact, that's a constraint on solutions to general relativity. We know that as m go to 0 or r goes to infinity, we're talking about going to flat space-time. It's got to be consistent with all weak field tests. We've got to have a harmonic solution. and uh, I say, because, you know, if you think about the sun going around the sun going, the earth going around the sun four billion times, that certainly looks harmonic to me. And then I have this one additional constraint with my proposal, and that is that it's exactly constant. So exponential uh, functions have inverses, and when you multiply those together, of course, it ends up being constant. And if you set that exponential to be equal to g m over c squared r, well, then what you get is something that looks like a dynamic metric form, but it's not a dynamic metric. It's something that's formed in order to conserve space times time. And it's kind of awkward for me to discuss this with professionals because they only want to talk about metrics, dynamic metrics at that, and I want to talk about a symmetry that they don't, they can't discuss because they don't even have a space times time on on the paper. Oh well. So I'm really dealing. My unification is is dealing with special relativity and gravity, that as a problem of algebra, quaternion algebra, and not a field theory. So that's great. No fields, no graviton, no quantum gravity, despite all the papers and outreach on such proposals. Uh, it's great because the math is simpler, but it's bad because, you know, tensors are everywhere and people don't want to lose their quantum gravity theory jobs. <laughs> OK, so the slides are available. I have a, uh, a site dev devoted to quaternion gravity per se. And I also own quaternions.com, where I kind of do kind of more broad uh, re research. All right. So I hope that gave you an impression of my talk. And thank you for your time. Goodbye.